welcome again to Short Takes. We are the Alabama Takes version of a talk show, and I'm your host, Blaine Duncan. Joining me today is a long-lasting, excellent musician, songwriter, studio artist. For many of you, may only know him as a studio artist, but I've got news. He does a whole lot more. He, he goes well beyond that. I dare say he's one of the busiest musicians and songwriters today. It's Mr. Will Kimbrough from Mobile, Alabama. I'm glad to be with y'all. <laughs> uh, and you are from Mobile, Alabama, right? That born I'm and from raised? Mobile. And you uh, spent some time in Tuscaloosa? I never lived there, but I, okay. I spent a lot of time playing there in the uh, 80s and early 90s, probably from about 82, late 82 to, you know, through 92, 93. Okay. And then since then, I haven't been there as much. But I, I, I mean, I was there a lot to where you would think I lived there. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> in my the, younger days, I would be staying at somebody's hundred dollar a month college house with eight other people for like a month. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. But the, I, I moved to Nashville in 1988, and that's been where I've lived ever since. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. The reporter Mark Hughes Cobb out of Tuscaloosa. Yeah. He love him. he really or, or he he turned me on to you really. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, so he kind of talked about you, and I just got a sense that you lived even in Tuscaloosa, but I, I see now what you're talking about. You are uh, very active on Instagram and yep. social media in general, I think. And it, it's almost to the point where you, you know, I talked about in the intro, you are busy. Yeah. Yeah. It's Do you have a free the, um, moment ever? Sure. I set them up. <laughs> and, um, but also, what I do for a living is, would be my hobby anyway. You know, it's what I, it's what I love. So, so I, I, I take, joy and going to work almost you know i'd say 99 percent of the time you know that i just got back from montana with emmy lou and um uh, jason isbell was there and you know representing alabama too and uh, mm -hmm. we were the last two bands on saturday night show and twenty five thousand people hopefully it wasn't a super spreader but enjoyed <laughs> it very much out there in the beautiful montana a little little bit of forest fire smoke in the air but it was beautiful and so, you know, we're out there working and um, it's what we love. So we get the opportunity. I look at it every time I get hired to do something. It's like I have an opportunity to do what I do. And, uh, and again, it's 99 percent creative work. You know, mm -hmm. what do you what do you want to play on this song? How do you want to write this song? How do you want to produce this record? How do you want to play your own music? And so those questions are I love answering those questions with my instrument or words or, or voice and. So that's what I, that's what I get to do, you know. Lucky. That's a great, that's such a great outlook too. I'm glad you, you look at it. If I didn't it have like it, that. it would be, it would be sad. It really would be. <laughs> it would be a job, you know. And yeah, even during COVID, you played on the front porch, mm -hmm. live streamed shows. I mean, you, yeah. you didn't, you didn't stop, you didn't slow down, and and your joy comes through. I think in your albums. I think it's I it's it's coming around to that. I think. And, um, and I, I mean, maybe it's always been there, but I, I feel it now more than ever that it's just like the opportunity to do what you wanted to do, what you love to do and play with people that you never dreamed you would play with. You know, I never dreamed I would be playing with Emily Lou Harris for 10 years. And, and so how did that come to be? Well, do you remember how it started? It's a long story because everything about me now is a long story because I've been here <laughs> since 1988. And then b yeah. before that, I'd already put out a couple of records when I lived in Alabama, when I lived in Mobile. Right. And so it's a long, you know, 40 year journey since I basically since I got out of high school now. So, but I won't bore you with the, the longness of it, but just to say that, uh, I moved to Nashville. I was in a band called Will and the Bushman yes. and we got a record deal and we got out of that record deal. And then I was in a band called the biscuits and we made a record for John Prine's label and, and that band broke up. And then I went on the road with Todd Snyder for about five years. Mm -hmm. And I still work with him off and on. So that's a, another long 27-year, you know, working relationship. I worked for years with Rodney Crowell, one of the great songwriters of all time. Yes. And and then um, after that, I worked with a whole bunch of different people. And, and I started working with Jimmy Buffett. And I've been working with Jimmy Buffett since 2004 now. Oh, how about so that? So I've got uh, about 16 songs on the last five Jimmy Buffett records that I've either written or co-written. And so through uh, Rodney Crowell, I met Emmy Lou because mm -hmm. they have a long working relationship that goes back to the mid seventies. And at some point she called me and asked me if I would go on tour with her. And I said, I, 
I'd love to. Let me check with Rodney. And she said, oh, I didn't realize you were still working with Rodney. I'm not stealing his guitar player. And I said, okay. So, and then uh, in 2011, they actually had auditions. And I got an audition, and I went and auditioned for the gig, and I got the gig. And so I've been working with her off and on ever since. And the Buffett thing came because I was with Todd Snyder, and he was on what used to be called Margaritaville Records. Mm -hmm. So we were in New Orleans, 1996, and playing at Tipitina's. And uh, Buffett was there, and Jerry Jeff Walker was there, the late, great Jerry Jeff Mm -hmm. Walker, who just died. They were both there, and so it was a big mob scene backstage. And this backstage is probably the size of a big respectable public school broom closet um, <laughs> with about 150 people packed in there to, you know, party with Jerry, Jeff and Buffett. Nobody could even see that I, that I was standing there with Buffett because everybody was looking around and trying to find the free beer and what whatnot. <laughs> so I turned to Jimmy and I said, Hey, I'm Will Kimbrough. I'm from Mobile, you know, just like you. And he said, mm-hmm. Oh, you're another escapee. And uh, <laughs> I said, That's yeah, good. I guess so. <clears throat> and um, he got in touch with me 2003 and wanted to hear songs, so I sent him songs, and we've been writing it, writing together ever since. That's really cool. Yeah, and along the way, and so now I work with Songwriting with Soldiers, which is a program that um, helps combat veterans and first responders tell their stories, and oftentimes it's the hardest thing for them to do. They don't even tell their children or their spouses or their best friends that are non-military mm-hmm. or non-law non, non you know, law enforcement or, or firefighter uh, their stories, and they, they keep it inside it's part of PTSD really. And so, uh, so we're just a little bitty part of opening up and telling their story. And it's, um, it's incredible. And that's kind of part of, that's what the biggest thing I did in 2020 was that songwriting with soldiers grew as a program by 300% because there were so many people in crisis that needed to be in this program. And we're just a tiny bit of it. I'm not saying that me writing a song with a group of, of combat veterans is the main thing that helps, but it's a little tiny piece of it. I'm a professional listener without judgment that's my job and i listen and i listen for the song and the stories and the common story in the stories because it's usually a group six eight ten people Mm -hmm. and you sit there for two hours and at the end you have a song and the next morning Mm -hmm. you go back over it go back over the notes so people feel like they've been heard that's really cool and not judged and so i think that does help people and i i love it so anyway the main thing is i love it so i have a lot of jobs and it keeps it keeps growing but to have that, I'll tell you about that. The biggest thing about that is songwriting with soldiers, working with the Warrior Path program, is something I've been doing my whole life, writing songs. And that's primarily, I think of myself as that, a songwriter who plays instruments and can pass as a lead guitarist. <laughs> um, I mean, true, truly, there's much better lead guitar players than me out there, but I, I, I know songs, and I don't get in the mm-hmm. way of the song. And that's why that's I get deep. to work with Buffett and Emmylou and, and Rodney and Todd Snyder and all these people, because the song needs to shine through before anything else. And that's what I've learned to do from Hank Williams to the Beatles to the Rolling Stones to Drive-By Truckers to mm-hmm. Muddy Waters, you know, the song. It's, it's, anyway, a, it's a very so. Mike Campbell approach from the heart. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. He and never got in the way of a song. And, I, I, you know, when I hear you're playing... I think of that too. Yeah, Mike Campbell, Keith Richards, um, you know George Harrison, a lot of people, but but mm-hmm. and a lot of Nashville people. We come to Nashville and it's about the song, and um, I mean whatever anybody thinks of the songs that come out of Nashville, there's a million others that nobody ever hears. Yeah, and there's also also all the history of you know Hank Williams worked here, Johnny Cash worked here, Bob Dylan came and worked here. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's pretty much the history of American songwriting. So. Yeah. It really <laughs> I mean, is. We're notwithstanding New York and George Gershwin and all the jazz people, and <laughs> so yeah, so, songwriting for uh, songwriting for soldiers, songwriting is, with with soldiers. Okay, songwriting with soldiers isn't mm-hmm. that? Correct me on Mary Gauthier's. Yeah, that's how I got involved. Actually, I was playing yeah. guitar on her album "Rifles yeah. and Rosary Beads." Yes, and, fantastic album. Yes. Yeah, and it, you know, it got nominated for a Grammy and um, yeah. and uh, lost to the great late great John Prine, but um. I was playing on the record, and Mary said to me at one point during a coffee break or whatever, she said, why aren't you doing songwriting with soldiers? And I said, well, I just don't have the, I haven't had the conversation with anybody to get that started. I'm ready. And so next thing I know, uh, Randy Foster, who's an old friend of mine, called oh, me. Yeah. And, and Darden Smith, who's the founder, uh, called me. He's no longer with songwriting with soldiers, but he's the founder. And he just recently left to start something new. But um, anyway, uh, I got involved, and it's been almost five years now, so. Yeah, I've heard her talk about it. I've heard mm-hmm. listened to that album that you played on. It's so mm-hmm. good. 
your most recent album, you brought up the late great John Prine. Right, right. That is one of your songs on your the most recent album that I have heard, which is mm-hmm. Spring Break from That's last it. year. Yeah. Yep. And people watching, there'll be some script below on how to get to uh, how to get that album. Mm-hmm. Willkimbro.com is probably the best way to do yep. that. I, the, my introduction to you, I think you referenced John Prine. You played Good Night Moon to mm-hmm. close your set. You had opened for Todd Snyder. I think it was around 03 at the Bama Theater in Tuscaloosa. Mm-hmm. And you and you said apologies to John Prime for this finger picking. I guess you uh-huh. uh, you were saying that you mimicking his finger picking sound. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, um, yeah. So what's on the horizon? Yeah, you've been in the studio. Can we mention I have that? Been. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I have been in the studio. Um, there's a couple of things uh, I would mention that 2020 was a crazy year for everybody and difficult yeah. for everybody. Um, a lot of a lot of loss, a lot of m- missed opportunities. A lot of uh, probably, hopefully, reflection, introspection, and learning. It's hard to figure out where where what I learned fits into what I'm doing now, which is just back to the sort of hamster wheel, which I love. I mean, I do love it, but it's like we talked about it yesterday with at the airport with the Isbell's band guys, and we were mm-hmm. all like, "Yeah, here we're all back out." You know, like all of a sudden it's just like we're back. You know, yeah, it's great, but it's also you know strange because we've never been gone before. <laughs> <laughs> you right. never had to come back. At the beginning of 2020, January 2020, before all the COVID madness, the, uh, I, wor- I, wor- I we made a new Jimmy Buffett record called Life on the Flip Side, and I played on the whole record, and I wrote, co-wrote or wrote four songs on there. So that, when everything shut down, I was like, well, at least I've got those Buffett songs out there. When that record comes out, you know, I'll have mm-hmm. something and some irons in the fire, you know. Sure. And I'd also worked on a Shamika Copeland record, and she's um, a great blues singer. Okay from chicago she's originally from harlem her daddy was johnny clyde copeland who was kind of a legendary blues guy i've been producing her last couple of records so her record on civil war came out in october 2020 the same time that spring break did mm-hmm. and um and i helped write eight songs on that so i had a, i had 12 songs on other people's albums in 2020 and then right. i had you know, 12 songs of my own on an mm-hmm. album for maybe 14. I put a few, quite a few on spring break, but so I had a, you know, it was an amazing year in terms of output of songs. Plus I, I did songwriting with soldiers January and February of 2020, and then started back in June flying around the country with a mask on mm-hmm. doing the warrior path program with the men and women in the PTSD treatment program. And so for me, it was like just a incredibly productive time. So since then, we went in in I think November 2020, right around Thanksgiving, with the Red Dirt Boys, who are the band that backs up Amy Lou, and we've been doing it for years, you know, 10, 12, 13 years, depending on the person in the band. Mm-hmm. And we made a second album. The first album was kind of under the radar, and they, you know, everything I do is kind of under the radar, but that's all right. <laughs> but that's, um, your, that's your memoir title. That's my memoir. Yeah, everything. Yeah, un, under the radar, whether I like it or not. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, we made a, a, a another Red Dirt Boys record, and so now they're both kind of officially coming out, and they'll just be like digital distribution because I don't know that we need to do physical distribution on this record. I would love it. We're, we do have vinyl and CDs, mm-hmm. um, but that record's coming out. It's called The Real Deal, and uh, Emmy Lou's on it, and she guests on it. Both albums, once, the first one's just called Red Dirt Boys, and the second one's called The Real Deal, and they're both getting officially released in the next few months. I'm not sure the exact date yet. I'm working with the distributor on that, but that's cool. That's coming out. And then I went in about two weeks ago, something like that and recorded Mm -hmm. uh, 10 new songs at the studio in in Nashville. And um, so I'm working on finishing that up and putting that out in probably early 2022 or something like that. So there's lots of music. Um, One thing about me is I always have lots of songs. And when I first moved to Nashville, you had a very active, record company and publishing company business. Um, And it's shrunk down just like the music business, probably down by about 60% from what it was. So in terms of just business, Mm -hmm. like global, you know, corporate kind of business. Mm -hmm. And so barely anybody has publishing deal anymore. The good thing about that is you're free creatively. You don't have somebody going, well, that doesn't sound like, you know, T. Graham Brown, man, or whatever, (laughs) you know, or that needs to sound a little bit more like Bon Jovi. But, uh, (laughs) you just do what you want and pitch it to the, to the marketplace. Yeah. Um, but people also used to get cuts on like a George Strait record and it wouldn't even be a single and it would sell 10 million copies. And there'd be some guy whose songs you've never heard of 
living yeah. in a big old mansion. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I do all that stuff myself, just like everybody else. That's the thing. I mean, there's a few people. Jason's rise is amazing. Um, it's, it's deserved. Yeah. I mean, I think I could name a few other people I think who deserve it just as much, but that's not the way it works. And, and so if somebody gets it, that deserves it, that's a good guy or a good gal <laughs> and, uh, sure. And, um, uh, and is, is kind and good to people and does quality work. In fact, who am I to say what, what that means? Whoever, whoever's doing well, God bless them, you know? And yeah. so it's good to see, it's good to see people. Um, and I'm glad to see the Alabama, uh, music scene be so healthy. It and there's is, a lot yeah. of it that's under the radar and you see like regional and local scenes that are mm-hmm. real healthy and out of those always come something. So, uh, speaking of nice, is Emmy Lou as nice as she seems? She oh, seems yeah. really she's, kind. She is totally kind. And she, you know, she's, if you think you've been on the road, you know, she's been out, out for, you know, 50 years. I know. Yeah. And she is still, you know, she rides on the bus, she rides in the van, she rides on the plane and she just gets up there and, and, and lights up. I mean, she got up there in uh, Montana, maybe the second gig she's done since COVID stuff opened back up um, mm-hmm. and just, just lit up. She's born to be up there, you know? Yes, she and, is. Jimmy Buffett also seems like he's a really nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's super cool and he loves songs. He loves his life. He loves yeah, life. He, he loves people. He doesn't, good to suffer, hear. he doesn't suffer fools gladly, but, um, just like, you know, anybody like that, that's like, Hey man, chill out, you know, but, but yeah, he's been, he's been great to me. And this last record, uh, like I said, I've done five albums and also helped sort of tech in the technical side, produce a record that is called buried treasure that came out a couple of years ago. That's just songs that he did in 1969 and 70 that never saw the light of day. Hmm. And so I sort of oversaw the archival part of that. <laughs> And did the, neat, put it together, you know, and, and mastered it and stuff, but, um, oversaw the mastering, Yeah. but he gets excited about a project and he's just in. So this album, I really felt like a, a, a true member of the Coral Reefer family this mm-hmm. time. I mean, nobody's ever made me not feel at home, but it's just more about, um, I really felt like I could speak up with my ideas and people, and we were free flowing with ideas and laughing. And, and then five days later we had done like 16 songs and just, you know, had a blast. That's a lot of songs in that amount of time. Yeah. I mean, he's got his band he's had for 20 years and some people like, you know, Michael Utley has been playing with him for like 40 years. And so, you know, it's a, it's a well-oiled machine. And when they give us direction, it's like, this should be rock and roll. And so we all turn up and start rocking. And then they, (laughs) you know, an hour later, the song's done, you know, and the next thing, this is honky tonk. This one's like reggae, you know? And so we're just moving from style to style and having fun. Fun. Is there a particular artist that's covered one of your songs that shocked you? There's a band called Divine Horseman that just did a song, and um, they are kind of a, um, and they're kind of like goth, goth. You know, it's like dark, yeah, darkness, and um, <laughs> and this guy's sort of a legendary goth guy, but but there's elements of country in there. As to me, there should be Hank Williams. Nothing's more goth than Hank Williams singing "I'll Never Get Out of This World Alive." For real, yeah, you know. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. anyway, so they recorded this song of mine and I got this email one day from, from this woman, uh, who's in the band. And she said, just want to make sure you're cool with us putting this out. And I was like, Oh wow. Divine horseman. I hadn't heard that in a while. She's like, yeah, well we hadn't been together for like 20 years, but we've gotten back together. So that was interesting to me to be covered by, that, um, that, that would be surprising. Yeah. But I'll tell you, uh, delightfully, su- uh, not surprised, but just delighted by the work I've gotten to do with Shamika Copeland and this last record, uh, it has a song in there called Clotilda's on fire, which is the only song I know of that tells the Clotilda story, which is the last ship that brought in enslaved African people into America. And that was in 1860 after it was long, had long been abolished. Mm-hmm. And um, it was over a bet. A couple of uh, rich guys from Mobile made a bet over probably drinks and cards. And one of them sent a boat over to West Africa and brought back a boatload of human beings. And they were caught by the Coast Guard so they had like these two sailing ships in Mobile Bay chasing each other and uh, they were going to get caught. So they, they set the boat on fire and uh, like just off the bay in the Delta near Spanish Fort. And they rowed away in a rowboat. People who had been brought over from Africa got out and swam to shore. And during the Civil War, they were all sent off to be enslaved. But after the war, the people who could get back came back and, and they established a community called Africa Town. And oh, yeah. it's also known of... as Plateau, Alabama and Africatown. Uh-huh. 
and it, it made a lot of news because they found the boat finally. So the story was sort of, um, what's the word, apocryphal. Right. You know, this had happened, but but the guys never, of course, the, the, the guys that did it never got prosecuted because, you know, that was the world. They were like, well, oh, those those rascals, uh-huh. those rapscallions. And it's a fascinating story. I'll leave it at that to so look it up. But, uh, but cool. we wrote a song for Shamika, and it's got Jason Isbell on lead guitar. So it's got, you know, some Alabama Mm-hmm. But then it's got this woman whose daddy was from the South, from Texas, who was a blues man, young African-American artist, Jamaica Copeland. And she grew up in Harlem and lives in Chicago, singing the story of the last slave ship to come wow. into America. So it's pretty cool that we got to do that. And I've actually recorded my version of it, which mine's a little bit more sort of super loud guitar, kind of Neil Young and Crazy Horse. Uh-huh. So my point of view of it is like, here's he just here's the story. And I think Shamika's wow. came from a slightly other point of view of like, this is part of why I'm here. You yes, know, as, yeah, as yeah, a yeah. person of color in America, and you're like, I know that my people were slaves, and here's this song. And anyway, it's it's fun to uh, get to write those songs. I mean, I guess it's just really up to uh, it's up to the writer what you're going to write about. So, mm-hmm. um, and it's sometimes you, you don't want all songs to be like dark and serious, but sometimes mm-hmm. you get moved. I was like, I should we should write a song about this, and Shamika should should sing it because she sang with me on my previous album uh, i like it down here a song called alabama which was a song written for michael donald who was the last person to be lynched in america in 1981 in mobile so i wanted to write that story because my mom lives right down in that neighborhood and my sister uh-huh. and i walk by it all the time i used to walk my mom's dog down there and walk past the sign you know this is where michael donald was killed and uh it's a you know amazing story and talk about fresh history 1981 right yeah i was in high is- school he went to my high school I didn't know him. Uh, he was older than me, but and so, you know, we wrote a song about that and Shamika sang on it with me. You know, I pitched her this other idea about Clotilda. And so, you know, we, we do a lot of different kind of stuff um, with Jimmy Buffett. We, you know, we have happy go lucky songs and, mm-hmm. and Shamika, we have a little heavier songs. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. That's good stuff. Yeah. So we want our viewers to check that out. I'll put a, a link or a reminder text yeah. on the screen for them. Uh, you ready to dive into our four questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. So I, I did mention your album Spring Break. That's the most recent. We've got mm-hmm. a, you're working on another. That's awesome to hear. Which so you got this maybe my favorite song of yours in the last few years is this wonderful, it's wistful, my my right wing friend. Uh huh. That one. And you make the statement to this friend that you are slower, fatter versions of the boys you were back then. My question to you to, to play off that is, do you think people remain the same in their core? I know physically we all change. You know, I've had so much trouble with this concept myself, and I'm interested in what you think. I think in general we do stay the same at our core. But then I know people who, you know, needed to get sober and got sober, and they're, they're, they, they no longer have that, you know, Mr. Hyde to the Dr. Jekyll that they used to have. So that's a difference. And I know, I know some people who have had struggled with mental illness where they were one person and then they seem to be a total different person Mm -hmm. and then maybe got medicated and then they're another person. So, but I don't think at their core, they're different, but I think there's, there are, there are things that, and also I know some folks who've had some experiences that, that marked them, you know, that they're, they're never without like a loss, you know, a loss of someone close to them or, Mm -hmm you know, an injury. And then there's spectacular people who seem to transcend it all and just come through. In fact, my mom, my mama said the other day, we we're talking about somebody she's about to lose in her life. Who's very close to her since for her whole life. And one of her last best friends is what I call it. You know, she's about to lose one of her last best friends, you know, at, at her age in her eighties. Mm-hmm. And she said, but you got to remember everybody needs to grieve in their own way. But the best way to live after someone you love is is lost is to remember the good things with glee. And so I was mm-hmm. like, wow, I'm going to, I'm going to, so I wrote it down. Yeah, that's know. good. And it's not just la, 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 everything's okay, but it's, it's more like, yeah, I miss them. But man, the reason I miss them is because we had such a good time. And here's, here's one of the things that they said that always makes me laugh. And, you know, that's a long winded answer, but no, I think at our core stuff. we are the same, but I, but I also think that there are things that can change us to where the people that are around us have a hard time seeing us as the same person. Yeah. Dementia. My father had dementia, so he was the same person, but he also, he wasn't sure who we were. So that changed mm. the relationship a little bit, you know? Yeah. 
it, it, uh, the reason why I've had a little trouble with it is because so many of my friends who I'm assume, who I assumed were one way when we were growing up, especially as teenagers, mm-hmm. when we were cutting up and being silly, had, and I assumed we all had the same worldview. And uh-huh. then now it's yeah. 30 years later, and we do not have the same worldview, right. as it turns out. So, yeah, I, by, and I do think there's, you know, there's a lot of ways to look at the, you know, the old two kinds of people. My days, son, there's two kinds of people in the world, you know, about anything. And um, there are people who get in an ad- adult situation and and realize that, you know, you got to pay your taxes or you got to mm-hmm. work with other people. You got to, you know, and, and sometimes it really makes them mad. Yeah. And it, sometimes it makes them mad for like the rest of their lives. Yeah. And uh, and like sort of like in your 30s, you got you, you have children, you get married, you have a job and there's a line you can cross that's like the bitterness border, mm-hmm. you know, like you go th- hand them your passport and go into bitterness land. Yeah. And I, I you know, obviously I, I prefer not to do that because I've, I've been there and I realized how pointless it was and how, how untrue it is. Yeah. I mean, I can understand. I mean, I'm not suffering. Sometimes I suffer normal things, death and taxes that everybody, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. getting old, you know, mm-hmm. my mother would also say getting old sucks, but it beats the alternative mm-hmm. until you're ready to go. You know, I'm not ready to go. So I'm, I was complaining that I had to spend all day flying to Montana and then, and then work one day and then spend all the next day yeah. flying back. And I did it, but guess what? I was with my friends, got to play yeah. and sing with Emmy Lou and on the way back and on the way there, I was with, with all of them, ate lunch at the Denver airport and laughed our heads off. Cause we're all together, just a bunch of funny people from all over, you know, from Rhode Island, from London, from Emmy Lou from originally from Birmingham, huh. me from Mobile, wow. Brian Owings from Columbus, Mississippi, practically oh, yeah. Alabama. Yeah. And, um, I grew up in Sullivan, which is uh-huh. just across the right line there. from, yeah. from uh, yep. uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll wrap up question one by just saying that, uh, my right wing friend is the best topical song I've heard in the last 10, 15 years. It, th- those can you. be hard to write and do, do do the song justice and and say what you want to say and still have just a really great song but you thank you you. it i was lucky with that song because i all i had to do was write down the story (laughs) i i and my right wing friend had lived that Mm -hmm. story now that it was of course it's indelibly marked with my point of view that's why you write a song in a way to either try to express some idea or express your own point of view and even if you're trying to express somebody else's story it's through you you can't help it all yeah. songs are personal, whether they're written from that point of view or not. But, um, but, I, I, but, but he, but my right wing friend, mm-hmm. I played it for them. And I mean, I actually, I sent him an MP3 and then he was sitting down there in Alabama and mm-hmm. played it to, for his wife and, and his, his, uh, his, his wife's sister, his sister-in-law. And the, he said they were all teary eyed. I bet. And, um, I because I told him it was. It a, touched a, me. It touched mm-hmm. me. Yeah, it's a love song to friendship. And it I've is. said that a lot. It's like it says, and, and I've had people say, "How can you? How can you say that? That that you know, someone that is not right wings chastised me once for like making nice, and I was like, well, he's my friend, and I know. And when we talk personally, mm-hmm. it transcends all of our differences, and that's the way the world can work. Because if yes. we're all the same, then it's a pretty, it's pro- there's a lot of problems with that, with that, because we need people that yeah. can do different things and f- play different roles and they're going to have different points of view. I've had to learn that over all these years that, you know, when Will and the Bushman got a record deal in New York, mm. I didn't understand that it was just business. I thought they just thought we were awesome. Uh-huh. And somebody thought that we would make them money. And mm-hmm. then when they, when we made the record, they had a meeting and there was no consensus as to whether we would make them money, mm. which meant to the corporation, this bar of soap ain't going to sell. <laughs> yeah. And so they came back and said, you know, we'll give you three months worth of tour support so you can go out on the road and we'll see. And then, you know, where they did promote it, uh, it did well. Where they didn't, it didn't do anything. And that's just the way bars of soap are sold. That's right. And, you, and it can either, and that's another line I had to cross, like as a, newly realized that I am a product for sale, does that bother me too much to continue doing what I do? Mm -hmm. And I had to learn that was like, Oh, I just, just be me as much as possible. Put that in the forefront. And that way I will, if I get hired to be somebody else, I probably won't be up for the job. So I've made it to where 
when they get me to do a job, they're literally getting me. Yeah. Like I'm not going to sound like exactly like somebody else. Mm Mm-hmm. And I may not play the same guitar solo every time, but that's why, I mean, Emmy Lou wants that. She wants people out there going for some sort of inspired take on things. And sometimes she's a little bit like, okay, guys, that was great, but dial it back a hair. We're not, <laughs> okay, yeah. we're not the Grateful Dead 1974, you know, but, um, <laughs> and I was like, oh, come on to, to do music. You know, I, I would, and if, if uh, this is unsolicited advice, but I will just say it out there. Uh-huh. If you write songs, write songs, you know, pursue that because that will be the way that you have the the possibilities of actually making a living in music. I think, I mean, if you Mm -hmm. don't and you're the greatest drummer in the world or bass player or guitar player, then go for it, you know, and you'll find your way. But if you do write, don't, don't, don't leave that on the back burner because that's Mm -hmm. uh, your mode of expression Mm -hmm. and satisfaction and being heard in the world. It's also the best way to make a living in music. If you have songs out there that work for you, Mm -hmm. Um, at this point, since I started putting songs out into the world and into sort of what's now the digital system yeah, in 1985. So I'm like, I still get a penny from like stuff from 1985 every quarter, you know, or like yeah. a dollar from a Will and the Bushman song that was on a TV show in 1989. And so it makes you realize that's not why I do it, mm-hmm. but I'm glad I did because sure. that's the thing. As a producer, some people do really well with it. I've produced some, some really good records. Todd Snyder's East Nashville Skyline is a high point. It's one of my favorite records. You know, and I mean, I got to produce that record and he, he, he didn't need a producer, but he, he wanted me to be there to go. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And yes, I agree that we're done. <laughs> and, and I mixed, I mean, I mixed that record. That's the only record I've no, ever mixed. Wow. Except for spring break. I'm not a mixer, but yeah, that no, record that was done. fantastic, man. Well, it was done on eight tracks of analog tape and mixed to tape. And it finally just came out on vinyl in 2019. Yeah, it was hard. So, yes. Yeah. And so, I've been looking for it or keeping my eye out for it for vinyl. And then you're right. So yeah. that was a record where literally you have four, um, you know, four fingers on each hand, pushing a fader uh-huh. and not, not a hundred tracks on a computer being squashed up together, like a modern recording. It was very much like 1971 kind of recording. Mm-hmm. So I knew, I knew that territory very well just from listening to okay. those old records that I like so much. So. so our next question is, uh, you've offered, you offered to share a story or two mm-hmm. from the Tuscaloosa years when you spent so much time there. Mm-hmm. What's, what's your favorite or weirdest tale from that era where you had a lot of time? I'll tell you one, uh, I, Actually, I, I think I can fit in, too, with not too much time, if that's all right. I, I'm, start I'm, with, I'm here as long as you are. <laughs> I went this to is see, There was this great band from Minneapolis called The Replacements. They're pretty well known, you know. Nah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And legendary for their antics. You know, they were, they were n- notoriously inebriated on stage, and that was kind of mm-hmm. their thing all the way up until the, you know, I know people that saw them open for Tom Petty here at the amphitheater, and they came out on stage in dresses like, people did in the nineties, you know, put their dresses on mm-hmm. and came out and then they played for about 20 minutes and kind of fell over. <laughs> and, but they got away with it. People loved them more for that. I, I always wanted to just hear them play their great songs because they had so many great songs, but I saw them in 1984 and they were just in a crummy van playing little clubs. So I'm two nights in a row. And the second night was at uh, the Chucker in Tuscaloosa. Oh yeah. And so now remember this is 1984. And one of the things that, probably should be written about in a novel or a movie or something or a documentary would be the the in in the reagan administration this isn't political this is just a fact they just defunded states mental health budgets and so that's a huge reason why homelessness skyrocketed in the 80s and that kind of built the homeless like community in america Mm. because people were just released from state mental hospitals because they just couldn't keep them anymore. So they'd be like, here's your meds. Mm. Have a good time. Tuscaloosa, of course, was where Bryce state, one of the, the biggest state mental hospital in Alabama was. So, so Bryce is, was at the time the biggest mental hospital in Alabama. So all these people got released. Downtown Tuscaloosa was just full of people that mentally ill people kind of wandering around. And they could hang out at the Chucker. They were welcome. So the replacements played about nine songs, mostly from the Let It Be album and uh, 
mm-hmm. Hoot Nanny album, great songs. Mm-hmm. I was just, and I was like, this is fantastic. There's like 50 people here. I'm, I'm hearing my favorite band in the world play their songs. And then the band started wandering off the stage. Just the bass player put his bass down and wandered off. <laughs> And the show's still going on. And then the guitar player put his guitar down and the lead singer ended up. And then finally the drummer, they played, uh, if I only had a brain from the wizard of Oz uh, yeah. and, uh, with the drummer on guitar and the lead singer, Paul Westerberg on oh. drums. And then the drummer wandered off leaving <laughs> Paul Westerberg, you know, one of the great songwriters of rock and roll history yep. sitting on the drums. And so next thing you know, there's three Bryce outpatients. One guy literally wearing a trench coat, like looking like a flasher. And um, they got up there and they played, you know, Louie Louie and all those kind of songs for about 20 minutes. And then the band got back up there and played. So anyway, that was my chucker, you know, uh, the replacements come to Tuscaloosa. And of course, the people drawn closest to them are the Bryce outpatients. Yeah, yeah. And they let they let them up there. It was beautiful. That's fantastic. And then uh, the, uh, that's a good chucker story, too. Oh, gosh. Yes. There, so, there are so, so many more out there. but There are so many, uh, you know. Um, and I'll tell you one more yeah, about the dude. Chucker. I had this briefly had this band I threw together with some friends in Tuscaloosa and, and they, some of them were in this band called casual love. And so we, we had half of their band and then me and my friend, Rob trucks, who was teaching at Alabama at the time, who now lives in New York. He's a writer. Um, we formed a little side project with them and we called it cows in love instead of casual love. So we were cows <laughs> in love and we were playing down there one like Monday night just for fun, you know, but of course there'd be a crowd in there. It was the eighties. People went out every night. Maybe uh-huh. they still do. I don't know. But in the eighties they did. I remember I'm, that night I met Margaret Atwood who wrote the handmaid's tale <laughs> oh, wow. and she was a writer in residence at the university of Alabama, you know, master's creative writing at that time. And so she's just there with her students, you know, drinking, drinking beer out of p- p- plastic cups. Yeah. And after we played, I remember I had a conversation with her f- briefly and this is Margaret Atwood. I knew who she was because my mom is a, you know, has a million books. And, um, and so I'm standing there talking to her and she said, I enjoyed that. That was fun. And I said, well, thank you. And, and she said, you know, musicians get to, uh, just kind of like, cause I think we played a few songs we had written and she said, you know, when you write a song, you can just get up the next, like as soon as you've written it and get up there and play it and get this instant response. Right. She said, writers don't get to do that. She says, I work on a you know, novel for, five years and then I have to go do a book tour and I've gotten so used to being by myself with a typewriter or back then probably a word processor or whatever. But, and I remember that I'll never forget that being uh, Margaret Atwood at the Chucker. That is so good. Yeah. And then what, and then, uh, we're Robin Zander from cheap trick got up and sang with us at the ivory tusk one night, right after that uh, things, you know, the Chucker, we kind of got too big for the Chucker. So we moved on to the bigger places where we Mm -hmm. could, charge three dollars to 500 people and we they had played the for the uh university concert that day uh-huh. and then we were playing at the ivory tusk and sea of college kids out there doing their thing and then towards the end of our first set it's probably about one o'clock in the morning you know when the this guy comes up to the front of the room doesn't look like a college student you know older you know grown-up guy mm-hmm. and he's like hey uh robin zander wants to sing with you guys Can I bring him up? And I'm like, okay. So he got up and, and we did, uh, it's all over now and money, maybe day tripper or something, just classic Beatles stone stuff. And he just was knocked it out. And he was like two feet away from the microphone and he's not a big guy. He's like five foot six. And he just, you can, that that's when you're in the presence of somebody like, oh, I see why he's a rock star. Yeah. He said he got, he just got up there after he had done a whole show and been at the bar having a few drinks and stood about two feet back from the mic and just blew the roof off the place. And I was like, Oh, I see. Okay. So that I may not be necessarily uh, qualified for the rock star job, <laughs> Well, you know, clues, breadcrumbs along the way to realize who, you know, I've learned that I'm a creative person, I'm a writer and guitar player and I'm a singer too, but I mean, I get the difference uh, it, and it, I'm, it, and I'm thankful for that knowledge. My first bar, concert bar show was the ivory test because they allowed 18 yeah. year olds in right so i could go of to course that one. yeah get them in you you actually contacted us uh we had the alabama take just the podcast this is of course short takes our, our talk show but we had the uh, podcast and you reached out to us after our uh episode with elliot and said mm-hmm. you talked to elliot you know i've got some yeah i've got some stories about tuscaloosa too so those are fantastic 
So good. Yeah, there, there's so many. I mean, so our third question is, um, what motivates you the most? I think the thing that motivates me the most is just that I like to work and stay busy. Yeah. And I've, and I think I said it a minute ago, it's like, be yourself. I tell myself, go ahead, just be yourself. Studio recording session or a writing session doesn't work out because being yourself doesn't work. Then you go ahead and get to know that it's probably not meant to be anyway. You know what I'm saying? That's a good, so yes. I'm motivated by, by uh, finding situations where I'm going to thrive. Mm -hmm. But that also means trying almost any opportunity out. That's how I became a producer. Uh, Todd Snyder said, would you produce my record? I said, yeah, I don't even know what that means because the produce <laughs> producers I had worked with at that point, I wasn't sure what they were even doing except just sort of keeping us from doing what we wanted. Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, we're going to have to cut that guitar solo out of that song. We're like, that's the best part. We're going to cut it out. There's a lot of you acceptance know. in what you're telling me today. It, like you, yeah. you are very accepting of what he is. Well, I can't, con I mean, there is the serenity prayer thing that sure. they do and, you know, AA where it's like, give me the grace to accept things I cannot change. And that is a good thing to learn because it is all you can really do is do your thing and hope that it's good enough and sometimes really, really good or great and hope that other people go along with the program or that you get involved with the program that you can go along with. Mm-hmm without feeling too bad about yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, just in terms of work, cause that's what we're going to, we're, we're, we're made to work. You know, we're evolved to, to be busy and yeah. work. Our last question's the same for all our guests. It's, uh, what's done up real good for you. What's, what's, uh, tickling your fancy lately. I'm reading, uh, all the books by Elmore, excuse me, Elmore Leonard's great. I'm reading all the books by James Elroy that I never read. So he wrote LA confidential uh -huh. and, other American tabloid, but he's got about 10 books I've never read. Yeah. And I realized I had, I had dropped off the map from him. So I'm really enjoying that. Anything I can about him. Cause he's such an interesting character and he has an interesting take on being an artist or being a writer mm -hmm. and what, so he, he basically lives in, in, in his creative world is all set around between world war two and 1973 primarily based in the fifties in Los Angeles around law enforcement and organized crime. And, uh -huh. and he really knows a lot about it and he's got a lot of personal, uh, in, investment in it. His mother was murdered when he was a child. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And he went away from LA for 30 years and he came back and started writing all these books and, and he really researches it too. Like it's, and he'll, he even talked about, I heard a thing yesterday on the plane. I listened to a podcast interview with him and he is, Talk about a confident person who backs it up. I mean, yeah. man, he's like, you know, I know I'm great. It's cost me a lot, but I'm going to keep doing it. And he, wow. he really puts the, puts the research in and he'll, he'll attribute things to historical figures that they may or may not have done, but he only does it if there's like a question and there's not, you know, there's not a lot of backup about exactly who these people were and what they did. Mm -hmm. And he said a lot of stuff in the fifties because of the cold war and commie, you know, the, the whole commie scare, red scare and everything, McCarthyism and all that, that there's a lot of stories about people that are just sort of a blank. And so he's, you know, that's, they were asking him, do you ever get sued by people? He's like, I've had people try to sue me, but I, I know that like when I've done something, writing, filling in the blanks about a, a character, I know that I'm, there's a blank to fill. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. And, that is and he said, uh, you could do that with some, with some songs and music too. Oh yeah, you definitely could. So I'm, I'm reading, uh, James Elroy and, uh, and it's, <laughs> it's a trip. It's always good to be, uh, in the middle of a book to be reading. Oh like man. Reading. Yeah. Big time. Well, Will, your, your music is, is rewarding. It's vast. I encourage everyone to seek it out. Go to willkimbro.com. Get yourself a copy, um, spring breaks on vinyl. You can, mm -hmm. the most recent one. Uh, and you can find the rest of his work there. I I've enjoyed your songs ever since I heard a piece of work when it was released. That's really what's, what got me in good night moon. When you closed with, a with that mm -hmm. Todd Snyder show in Oh three, Oh four era. Some, sometime around that mm -hmm. it was around the East Nashville skyline era. Yep. So yeah, that's right. And maybe on your next album, you'll write, uh, the bitter border. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a lonesome traveler about to cross the bitter border, <laughs> handing in my passport. All right. Well, everyone, 
Everyone seek out Will Kimbrough, seek out Emily Harris and her upcoming shows. And we'll put some links in the show notes so you can just click on those with ease. Uh, thanks again to Will. You're very fascinating. We'll, we'll have you back on maybe in the future and get some more of those stories. Let's do it. To yeah. everyone else, I'll talk to you next week. Thank y'all. Found his finger by my mama's grave